Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hard to believe, but we have actually arrived at the final plenary of Transforming Transportation 2015. And uh, it has really been such an intensive two days that, uh, as I say, it's hard to believe that it's already over. Again and again, throughout the past two days, we have heard speakers here on the stage and also in the audience describing truly exciting initiatives that can make urban mobility a catalyst for social, economic, and environmental change. In other words, as somebody uh, told me was discussed in the logistics session, we need to find local solutions for global problems, and cities can do that. We've talked about new policy approaches to promote coordination and connectivity, not only within cities, but between them, as well as between municipal, national, and regional actors. We've talked about technological game changers. We've talked about systemic urban planning approaches. We've talked about new shared stakeholder approaches to making sh roads safer. We've talked about innovative financing. And we've discussed new links between the public and private sectors. So there are a whole wealth of transformative approaches and initiatives out there as we've been discussing in our plenaries and in our parallel sessions. The question is, how do we now maximize their impact? Talking about that is the goal of this final session, and we're looking to produce really actionable suggestions and commitments here in this final plenary, which is why we've entitled it, Call for Action, boosting shared prosperity through sustainable urban transport. And before I introduce our panelists or remind you who they are, since you have seen several of them already in the course of the past two days, let me remi remind you that you can follow Transforming Transportation on social media at hashtag DC TTDC15, and you can get more detailed conference information and this is important, copies of the presentations. They will also be made available on the website. So that's www.transformingtransportation.org. You will find copies of the presentations going up on that website as the conference comes to an end. So the conference lives beyond this final session. And um, finally, one more remark. I know you're tired of hearing about it, but we're still missing a translation headset from yesterday. If you happen to know where it is, there might be a reward for you if you turn it in. So many... Translation headset. <laughs> no, the reward is not a translation headset because they cost $400 a pop. So uh, your reward will be something perhaps a bit more modest. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists, beginning over here on the right with Jorge Kogan. He is senior advisor to the vice president of infrastructure at CAF, Development Bank of Latin America, and head of the bank's transport group. Formerly Secretary of Transportation for Argentina, he also has extensive experience working with the private sector, and he has served as consultant to a very wide range of firms and institutions. Seated next to him, and now I'm going to take a deep breath and try to get the pronunciation right, is Corny Hauzengha, sort of, not really. <laughs> <laughs> He is the Secretary General of the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, SLOCAT, the largest multi-stakeholder partnership on sustainable low carbon transport in developing countries. He played a lead role in the development of the voluntary commitments on sustainable transport at the Rio Plus 20 conference, including the unprecedented US uh, $175 billion commitment for more sustainable transport by the world's eight largest multilateral development banks. Now I'm going to skip over to this side and Alain Flausch, who is Secretary General of the International Association of Public Transport, UITP. He's also served as UIT President and as Chairman of its Finance and Commerce Subcommittee. And until 2011, he was CEO of the Brussels PT operator, STIB, where he led a complete renewal of the company's commercial approach and management. And now for our hosts on my right, Aniruda Ani Dasgupta. 
is the global director of the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. He's also leading the center's team of global experts in sustainable transport, urban development, and building efficiency, and serving as a member of the World Resource Institute's global management team, helping shape its overall strategy and growth. Prior to joining WRI, Annie served as the director of knowledge and learning right here at the World Bank, where he provided leadership and direction for the bank's role in offering knowledge services for development. And finally, Jose Luis Irigoyen, known to almost all of you, I think, but I'll introduce him nonetheless, director of the Transport and Information and Communications Technologies Global Practice at the World Bank. It is responsible for all transport and ICT activities with an active portfolio of around 42 billion US dollars in lending commitments and 224 projects in supervision. So, gentlemen, and uh, it is gentlemen, of course, uh, as uh, <laughs> behooves the transit, uh, transport uh, sector, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, <laughs> <laughs> a one gender panel. Uh, gentlemen, I would very much like to hear from you what you see as the key takeaways of these past two days. Now, of course, I realize that not everybody could attend every session. Many of you were also in bilateral meetings in the two days. But given that there were a number of key messages that were, in fact, repeated from session to session, I'm hopeful that you can help us really put together uh, a picture of the main takeaways. So I'll begin right here with Jorge Kogan and, and ask you to get us started. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, and good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, some of my friends here in the podium are always saying that uh, they are prepared for the worst when I start talking and uh, they expect that my realistic view <laughs> will not become too negative. Uh, <laughs> So uh, since they are going to be very positive when, <laughs> what they are going to say after I talk, uh, I just made <laughs> uh, my first reaction. Uh, I just, a couple of hours ago, I met with someone who had been working in the World Bank for many, many years and left three or four years ago. And he looked at the Transforming Transportation Program and he said, this has nothing to do with what I read in the Transforming Transportation that I attended seven or eight years ago. What's going on? Uh, are you still talking about transportation or what is this meeting all about? <laughs> and I think that one of the main good things that are coming out of this is that the transport experts, the transport uh, practitioners are changing the language. We have opened our minds to many other subjects that uh, we didn't consider 20, 15, even 10 years ago. And I think that this is attracting other disciplines and is bringing the discussion to a much more realistic level in where uh, people matters more than the technicalities. Uh, having said that, and coming personally from Latin America and working for a Latin American multilateral development bank, uh, I find some things that are a little bit uh, out of the real world. Uh, in this discussion, there is a lot of generalization. And when we are talking about cities, we are talking about cities in general, but the cities of the first and the second and the third world are very different among themselves. When you go to regions within the same region and even within the same countries, cities are very different. And many of the concepts that we have been discussing today, in many cases, are meaningless for the people and for the authorities of those cities. So I think that the language is good. I think that we probably are discussing the right agenda, but this agenda is not possible to be generalized. It cannot become universal and we always have the risk of getting isolated from, from the reality. Many cities are still lacking of the basics, and lacking of the basics stop them from getting involved in this much more sophisticated uh, agenda. So you talk to many authorities in the region about SDG, and I'm using the letters to make it even more complicated, or you can say COP. 20 or 21st, which I did it 
a couple of months ago, inviting people to come to Lima, and even talking to ministers in some of the countries, and I said, are you coming to COP21? Sorry, to COP20. <laughs> and they said, what? <laughs> Can you tell me what COP is all about? Yeah, I heard there is a meeting in Lima. What, what is the meaning of COP? And I said, well, talk to partners, and they said, partners of what? So they cannot even understand the words that we are talking about, and we all believe that these words are like the first words that the babies are saying when they are born. <laughs> so this is, a, this is widening the gap, and I think we must avoid this happening because then we will leave all this other big amount of interest or, or political will out of the picture, and I think this is something to be looked at. Uh, the other conclusion, or my personal conclusion of all these discussions is that uh, we are talking about cities, and it looks like cities where most of the development is taking place in the world, but particularly in Latin America, the, the figures have been mentioned, 80% of the population lives in the region. The re the, the, in, the city, in the cities, cities is the place where most of the social conflicts are taking place, where the inequality is very clear. Uh, many cities are becoming be very energetic. But these energetic cities, in many cases, have to deal with very lazy na national governments. So how to resolve this conflict in where energetic cities with a lot of ideas and modern proposals, but with no money, have to deal with lazy national governments that have the money, but that are not interested in the city because the power of making the changes are within the authorities of the city. But these authorities cannot do much than general policies if they don't have the money. This is another gap that had to be resolved one way or the other, because otherwise the talking is going to go on and on and on, and we will be very little implemented in the real world. So, uh, a proposal, and something that I have felt that has, has not been uh, tackled during these discussions, and this is the people, citizens. We are talking about measures, policies, that are for the people, but I cannot see very clear how people is participating. I think that the, or the, the only way that the countries can change, that the mayors or the authorities of the city can force national government is if there is a demand from the people. And people need to be educated. People need information that is not provided. People need to be empowered to make their voice be heard. And if people get information and is empowered, probably people can create the debate. And this debate could probably force local and national authorities to pay attention to these demands and eventually work together to sort out the problems that we, for the moment, had just put forward, but with very little ways of finding the solutions. Thank you very much. That was a takeaway, plus maybe a suggestion for Transforming Transportation 2016, as I read it. Uh, so uh, I've, I've put it down in my notes. On to our next uh, thoughts on takeaways, key messages from Mr. Hausengha. Thank you. Well, Jörg, I can assure you uh, that it was an, a resounding success. There is nothing to criticize uh, in terms of transforming transportation. <laughs> that, uh, I would like to make four points. Uh, first is the organizers are successful in every year in increasing the number of participants. Uh -huh. They are also successful in keeping the participants uh, in the room, which means that they are doing something good. Uh, because all of, uh, many of us have organized workshops and we know how difficult it is to keep the people. So, so I would say that that's one takeaway, is that the topic and the way that the thing is being set up, that, that, this, that appears to work. Mm? And I think that the, the, the constituency is becoming broader and broader. And I think that this is something like Jorge was, was pointing at, is like I say, we need to have buy-in. And I think like obviously there are always possibilities to, to broaden it further along the lines that you were indicating. But I think that the, the fact is that if we see what is happening in this process, that this actually 
is, is working quite well. In terms of the, the substance, um, I think that with the focus on cities, what we see is a further aligning of agendas. Um, and I think that this is a typical a case of the glass is half full, the glass is half empty. That you could say it is very good that we have this integrated approach to cities and transport and that we not just focus on transport, that we put it in the wider context. You say like if you pr put it from the other side, is there a danger that we are going too far and that, that we would lose the, the specific perspective on transport? So, so, so I think that that's a question like where the organizers need to balance carefully in order to, to maintain that it is uh, transforming transportation and that it is not transforming cities. Uh, the third point is, uh, is on knowledge. Like in a way, like a conference like this has, a, has an important role in, in disseminating knowledge. Um, what we do see in, in certain areas that there is a deepening of knowledge and that, that that new research is being presented and that, that we gain new insights. On the other hand, we also see that in some areas that, that we are actually repeating and rehashing the same old numbers that have been heard many times. So, so how do we balance that? Because it might be that these old numbers are old news for some of us, but it might still be new news for, for others. But but the question is like, in a way, you could say that transforming transportation also has a function in setting the research agenda. So, so, so that, that is a function which, which is important as well. Then, as you rightfully said, uh, Melinda, not all of us have been able to attend all the sessions. So you could say transforming transportation is, is partly achieved through imparting knowledge. Eh? It is also about action, and you ask us in the next round to talk about commitments and things like that. You could say that transforming transportation is also a marketplace. Hmm? And if you would look at why is it that a lot of us are coming in the cold in the first week of January <laughs> while we're still starting up our work, because this is where, where you can make contacts. And I think that that's the tricky issue, because on the one hand, you would like to have the people in the room, but on the other hand, I'm certain that the organiz organizers are also entirely sympathetic to the idea that deals are being made, that projects are being born, that, uh, that new ideas are being formed and things like that. So the challenge is in the, for example, like yesterday, or there was no lunch. That, uh, which is uh, an important networking function. So, in, in that sense... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, it, 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 it is something with, with which plays a role. That, uh, so, so I think that in the same way that Hoyk is making a proposal, uh, that my proposal uh, would be... Have lunch. It's not what you think. Free lunch. <laughs> that, uh, that my proposal would be is like, how do you create uh, a space uh, in the conference uh, in a manner that it does not go at the expense of the conference itself, but that this, this networking, how do you facilitate and how do you enable that? And I think that also as the organizers, it would be good, I think, that if as the organizers, if you would be able to keep track somehow of the deals which are being made here, because I think that this would substantially enhance the, the attractiveness of the conference uh, that you say to, to future participants or to future sponsors or, or to, to, to presenters. Eh? And I think that's so, so, so that's the proposal from my side. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're, we're going to skip over Ani and Jose Luis for now and come back to them in the end of the round. So Alain Flausch, next uh, over to you. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Um, I will not concentrate on the, the format. Uh, we as UITP, we are, we are used to organize events of that kind and if, and if we can share with the, the organizer something we'll do with this pleasure, but it's not really what I, I, <laughs> I want to concentrate today. What, I, what I'm interested in too is that, you know, the concept of smart city, in, in, in French we, we use the word, it's a, 
Spanish in. That means he can get everything in this concept, and it's meaningless. I mean, that's the danger of... And I think, uh, fortunately enough, this conference was used to make this concept a bit more robust and a more specific, which I think was is an excellent thing, because uh, I'm afraid of, you know, like the word sustainable transport or smart cities, something that you use, it's a word, and finally is no action. So I, I'm very thankful for, for this, because I had some session today which shows that things are, are moving in this direction, although I do consider, like uh, Jose Viegas yesterday, is that there is a first meaning of smart city, and this first meaning is just providing a good public transport and biking and cycling system uh, and, and walking system in a, in a city. If we could do this on a worldwide base, we'll be already very happy. But in some part of the, and, and Jorg is, is right, it's true that when you talk to smart city in certain parts of the world, it's, it's not really the urgency today. And, uh, uh, but the whole idea is also that we could leapfrog and, and try to avoid some the mistake that we made in the developed world to go directly to the, the smart uh, cities in, in and listening to to some of the people from Mexico, for instance, where they, or India, where they're talking about 100 smart city, which is only a small part of the country, is already a very interesting experience uh, from my viewpoint because it's it's trying not to be totally dragging behind the rest of the world and on the contrary to try to to keep going. Now, what I was thought also interesting is that. You know, smart cities is not only political decision making, deciding that they want to go that way, which abs uh, it's absolutely required, but it's also how they can cope and work with the private sector. I think that's there is a lot of thing to do in terms of capacity building, learning curve, in trying to be sure that all the cities are properly equipped with the right skills to deal with the big group. For, you know, when you talk to IBM or you talk to Siemens. I mean, you can be eaten quite easily because they, they, know, the, they know the game for a long time. And uh, I think in this respect, I, I kind of claim that the public transport people um, are eventually the one that can help the cities because we are used to this sort of uh, relation with the industry, help the cities to build the capacity and skills that are needed to, to approach the problem and to build solution uh, in a smart way. When I listen to IBM or Cisco, I think that we have now in front of us people that know what they're talking about. Now, they talk, they of course want to sell, which is absolutely normal, but on the same side, it could be sometimes selling things that we don't need. And so maybe there, there's just a lot of work to do to, to try to build that community uh, and the trust that it is needed. I'm a member of, um, of a high level group, another one in Europe on uh, smart cities, and the first meeting was absolutely stunning in this respect, because you had mayor of large city uh, like Barcelona or uh, Warsaw, or, uh, and uh, they would look at the industry like, you know, I wouldn't say cats and dogs, but at least unknown territory, unknown animals, because they're not generally doing this. And it takes a while just to build this, and this place is a good place for this to happen. That's the two things at this point in time I would keep in mind for for, for now. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask Annie Dasgupta for your key takeaways. Thanks. I, I first want to say, you know, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here, representing another organization, to working with my dear friends and co-hosting. This is great privilege to be sitting next to Jose Luzirgo and the same host talking about this. So it's kind of a weird feeling, but kind of <laughs> nice. Um, um, uh, <laughs> You know, this is my first uh, transforming transportation. Uh, I know in, my, in this panel, I think everyone, this might be the 15th or 10th or 4th, mine it's first. And uh, I actually liked it a lot. Um, and, and the funny thing is I've actually worked in this building for 20 years and I've never attended one of these. And that's what I thought this, this particular forum is trying to change. Uh, I thought they, what the whole, whole Two days was about putting transportation in the context of other things that's going on. That was my observation. How, how what's happening to the climate, what's happening to the cities, what's happening to technology, what's happening to the city itself and land value. So my takeaways were slightly more positive um, um, and just because I have nothing to compare with. Um, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that was relativizing in a big way. <laughs> uh, so I just want to point to four things that uh, stuck to my and and like I don't know I mean like you said I, mean, I wasn't able to attend all of them but I was able to actually meet fantastic people um, at the same time which I'm very happy about. Um, so one thing I thought I think uh, President Calderon started putting some ideas together the idea of connectedness and how connected cities have multiple co-benefit to the economy, to productivity, to the climate, that kind of trickled through during the discussions. And this, this whole idea of how transit and connectedness in a city actually makes a city very different, how you live it, how you, how you uh, be productive in a city, and how you actually experience the city actually changes if you change these things. So I thought that uh, framework that uh, Calderon put in place and how it trickled through, I think it might be repeated, a lot of us know it, but that becoming an accepted part of our discourse, I think, is actually very interesting. Second, I do agree uh, that a lot of our technology colleagues are, are selling things, right? They, they, uh, that's their business. But I thought the main message was a lot of the technology is here. But is it how we actually work with it, how we use it to make cities government at the one time to take smart, informed, more evidence-based decisions about how, how to do things? At the same time, how we can leverage that to make citizens more uh, finding, uh, holding governments more accountable, participating in different way in different decisions. These are things for us to use technology to do so. So I actually found that that message, at least to me, that the technology was here is actually for us to figure out how best we can use it. There were a lot of discussion, um, and which I like very much because I come from the city's background. Um, of, of connection of cities, tra transit, transport, and land use, and change of land use, and how that directly affects not only the price and cost, and also how, is, how inclusive a city is, or how poor people, where people, poor people get to live, how far they live from the city center, how, how much they can live and access the various parts of city that actually makes it prosperous, access to jobs, access to uh, education, access to uh, recreation. So that conversation, which I, I think has to happen much more, um, of how transit actually affects this, where people get to live, where people get to work, how quickly they get to work, how much productive they are, how much time they waste getting to work, and things like that. Um, so the, the, the whole idea of inclusion of, of different parts of society and cities is very much connected to how cities actually move people around. I thought that resonated with me, and there were then a couple of conversations. And finally, um, I do think that uh, this year, especially this year, that a lot of these things we will achieve or not achieve uh, will be very dependent on the connections we make and the and the partners we have, partners we have. We have the WRI, for example, not only have partnership with the bank, but C40s of the world, the ICLEs of the world, to get actually things done together. So for us, uh, that is a very important part of how we want to do our work, uh, and I hope. That is one function of, uh, organ uh, of events like that, to strengthen those or build new uh, partnership for us. Thanks. Thank you very much. He's got one. My turn. So uh, very interesting discussion this today, and I agree that the pre pre uh, former President Calderon really was able to set the stage uh, in a fantastic manner. We like to perhaps put together so three and um, the kind of key messages and the three labels that I heard. The first was uh, has to do with speed and scale. Likely it or not, you can see that local issues like congestion, air pollution, because of uh, the context in which we are, the emerging trends, these issues are becoming now national and global priorities. When we talk about emissions in, in the city, it's a global priority. When we talk about the impact that c if cities uh, congestion could have in a given country, it becomes a national issue. So, likely it or not, the three have to come together. And in order to be to have impact, you need to have concerted action at these three levels. So, some of you work at the very local level and may think all this discussion that Corney brings every year about where we go with the global agenda. Well, we need all of this to first voice. Uh, raise awareness of these issues, and also because through this concerted action, we make it easier for those who have to take different tough, tough decisions to implement them. So we have this calendar uh, this year in which we have three big things converging, and we have to be ready as a community to 
come with one voice on what we want to, how we want to be prepared to have an impactful discussion. So probably uh, for uh, the SDGs, we may need to have a robust result framework that could be measurable and credible for the global community to accept uh, the transport targets. For the COP, we will need probably to have some bold action like a uh, discussion we had on removing uh, fuel subsidies, for example, in certain countries, proposals, or really bold action in a number of cities or countries that are committing. And th what is important is that we prepare all this on time to influence the discussions. Road safety, probably we need not only to push from the global side, but also to work more closely with civil society so that they can put pressure on governments and create the demand for, uh, for action on road safety. And we have a limited time frame. This is the year. So we have to be very careful how we bring all this community together in order to influence the process. The second set of messages, I, I will put it under the label of leadership, courage, and policies. We have a lot, uh, we heard a lot about the need to have strong leadership and the courage to challenge the status quo. You heard uh, Mayor Mancera talking about this reform, the mob uh, mobile law, uh, the, and, and the need to reform, for example, minibuses. We all know this is one of the most sensitive things you can do. It's really problematic. It would be easier to do more and more BRTs, but when he says that 60% of the emissions are coming from that, we need to pay attention. No, it doesn't matter how difficult it is. So that's why when I say that this concerted action will make more easier, will make it easier for mayors like Mancera to do that kind of reform. And also we heard a lot about policies. And we don't have money, but at the same time we have at hand a menu of instruments like parking policies, for example, that have tremendous impact. The issue of uh, fuel subsidies that I mentioned betterment levies on land value capture. So what prevents us from doing that? So there is a responsibility for these leaders and for the transport community to support this is decisive action in these fields. When you see today Bogota and Transmilenio, we were really, we had the privilege to support uh, Transmilenio, but before that, there was a mayor that had to pass the betterment levies, as they would call in, in in the context of Colombia in Bogota, to really uh, take the city out of bankruptcy and make this happen. So, as uh, we heard from several of our speakers, you can achieve results in three years, provided you have this vision, the policies associated with that, and the courage to implement them. And the third label is partnering and sharing. We heard about sharing everything, bicycles, cars. I would like to highlight two aspects here. One is, as I mentioned before, concerted action will imply that national governments work together with the cities. In the context of uh, New York may not be needed, in the context of many emerging cities, if there is a need. It will take time until you generate all the, the resources you need. So it's very important that they work together. So that's one partnership. Then there is the partnership of knowledge sharing that you, you heard a lot. And this is an example, and we are all here committed to doing it. And then there is a third kind of partnership. Uh, when we talk about PPPs, we usually think, uh, oh, we bring the private sector to finance big chunk infrastructure. There is also something more than that. It's the role of a government in creating a platform that will allow the private sector working together with the public sector in creating value and business for initiatives for innovative initiatives that could bring solutions. For example, in Paris, uh, this uh, uh, Autolib, or, or what's the name of, of the car sharing arrangement, electric car sharing arrangement, Autolib, Auto Auto uh, electric car sharing arrangement, it will not be possible if the government doesn't offer, for example, preferred parking and facilities to charge the batteries. So in doing so, you create value, you generate a possibility of a business. So that's the kind of, sort of partnerships that we have to explore in order to bring innovation and, and, uh, and, and promote more the so solutions that can accelerate the move forward. Very good, thank you very much. Now I'd like to come to the actionable part. I would like to ask each of you to tell us 
what is your organization, what is the institution which you represent going to commit to make the things happen that we've been talking about here? And I'd like to ask you too, because I am mindful that our time is limited, tell us first of all what you're going to do and then tell us, but briefly, what you need other stakeholders to do to make that happen. So it's a call for action, first of all, for you on, to yourselves uh, and only secondarily to others. And I'm going to go this time in this direction. I'll start with Alain Flausch. Yeah, as you all know, this year is a, is a climate change year, is a SDG year, so obviously there is work to do there. And um, my, my first, I wouldn't say routine work, but as a representative of a larger number of operators of the world and, uh, and people that commit to help in this respect, obviously I will make sure that the commitment go for it, that we monitor them, and then we keep in, enlarging the number of people that are committed to help in, in this regard. But it's, I would say it's already, I wouldn't say it's past, but uh, I think what we need, you know, we need to build, I'm always looking at the car manufacturing industry. They are powerful, they are rich. They have been able to build for the last uh, 50 years a huge lobby, a huge gathering of, of stakeholders that are for the car, and we are very weak in comparison to them. So uh, if we want things to move, we need to f build coalition. Now the argument for public transportation and, and for sustainable transportation is generally being all well known. Uh, you know, it's an environment aspect, it's an inclusion aspect, it's a health aspect, although I think we should develop more these fatalities and health part. But there's one thing which always kept being in the mind of many people, uh, is that public transport is the transportation for the poor. Which I think is a great mission, by the way. But which is also damaging um, the view where politicians are looking at us. You know, we are spending a lot of money, we politicians, and it's huge money to, to invest in this. This is, so they never liked our, our dossier. They, they just look at us as being spending too much. I think we should do it the other way around. And uh, we should show how public transport is a part of the economic development and creating of growth, growth and jobs. And for that purpose, I think we missed, uh, I did that for a few years already, but on a general basis, we need to make a coalition with the business people. This may look like a very Anglo-Saxon approach, and indeed it's in England, for instance, London, where this is working fine, but I think we really can see and make with them an alliance to develop public transport because the connectivity in the city, the attractivity of a city, attracting people to come and work or to come and invest. All this depends on building a livable cities. And I disagree with Corny in this respect. I think transportation is just a means for the sake of developing our cities. I love transportation, being in it, but I, th I do think it's a bit wider goal. Uh, and it's developing cities which is of importance uh, for us today. And in that respect, I would just want to give a, uh, an example you know that in, in, in London, uh, of course it's a big city, but it's the same in my city, which is a small city in Brussels. In London, uh, London had a, a terrible problem of commute every day. The tube was not good enough. And so they decided some years ago to build uh, Crossrail. 18 billion pounds investment. And Crossrail 2 is starting now. So it means there is another need to a uh, transactional, transactional uh, uh, rail system. Of course, who advocate for this first was TFL, was Transport for London, the transport engineer, the transport planner. But what was smart to do was to try and go and see the business community and ask the business community to, best, to be the best advocate for this. And that happened. That means that basically the business community went to see the government of England and said, if you are not doing this, we're going to leave London sooner or later because the life of our people is terrible employees are already tired when they arrive at the office in the morning. And so what happened is that the business community went to plea for that case, and in addition to this, they put money on the bill. So, of course, not everything, because for this sort of infrastructure, it's more public money, the long run is needed, but they accepted that the tax, special taxation would be levied on them, so as to make kind of an office tax or whatever, so as to make part of the contribution. I think 
this is something that I want to continue to develop because I think we should no longer be viewed as spenders, but people investing in the future and creating value, both when we're building this sort of infrastructure, when we're operating them, but also by the interact impact that it has. You all know that a street where a, a, a corridor where you have either BRT, because I know we have a lot of BRT fans here, but <laughs> if you have rail, rail around this corridor, you have a whole development, a development of house, of business, value uh, capture is in, in the pipe also for this. So we really have a, a capacity to create wealth. And if we have capacity to create wealth, we are becoming viewed by the, the decision make very different. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain Flausch. And that uh, is a very good example of taking a message that we just discussed, namely that a connected city is a city with a more vibrant business community, a more livable city, and turning it into, into actionable uh, measures. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going to skip over once again and go straight to Corny Hausenkach. Thank you. Alain used the words, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> in 2015. I would say 2015 is the year that we can unleash our passion, which is a different way of approaching it. Like, looking at it, 2015 is a year that gives us the privilege to shape our future. And I think that how often does this opportunity come, come by? There will be many people who will be working in transport who will not have the opportunity to, to actually exercise an influence on what the world will look like. And this is a unique opportunity that is, is created for us in 2015 by putting the climate and the sustainable agenda, agenda in the same year. Like I was, and I think that this is an opportunity obviously that, that we should grasp, but we should not look upon this as we say like this is a complicated uh, institutional process, this is a lot of extra work and things like that. We need to say like how do we, how can we own the process? Mm -hmm. How can we make certain that it will go in a direction that we want it to go? Mm -hmm. And this is something where we could say like you asked us what we will do, like Slowcard will continue to act as the global voice on sustainable transport. The first thing that we will do is following the remarks of my neighbor is that we will try to unpack these processes. What does it mean SDG? What does it mean COP? So how can we make this clear to a wider audience and say that and, and simplify the process? Hmm? It is clear that a certain amount of advocacy is needed. Like, we know that after, how many, how many transforming transportations have we had? Twelve. twelve. Okay, after twelve, we, we really know what sustainable transport is about. So what we need to make certain is that we get word out to this larger community into these processes. In doing so, I think it will be important to go beyond just the advocacy and say what is sustainable transport and what would we like to see. One of the key things will be the means of implementation. If we don't have means of implementation, we will not be able to implement sustainable transport at scale. And I think that that is another gift, I would say, that we have received here in 2015 with these two processes. These two processes are putting a time dimension to the change that is required. And that is especially because of the climate change process. The climate change process does not say you should do sustainable transport, but the climate change process says we need to do sustainable transport at a rate that we are able to achieve the two degree scenario. The sustainable development goals say you should do sustainable transport at a rate that we can eradicate poverty by 2030. So, and that is, this needs to be reflected in the means of implementation. And I would say that over the last years, we have been practicing our arguments. Eh? And we need, to, we need to rally these arguments now. And we need to make certain that this comes together in the indicators for the, for the sustainable development goals, so that we have a robust set of indicators and that we say we as transport sector, by delivering these indicators, will be able to do our part in the global agenda. It is important that we are also 
that we look at the financing, and I think that this has been mentioned by several people on the stage already, that if there is no financing in place for the indicators at scale, we are not going to deliver it. So we will need to continue the discussion on finance that which, which took place here in uh, transforming transportation and which has been taking place at other places. Also, over the past years, the transport sector has made commitments. We made commitments, and you mentioned the $175 billion from Rio, but we also heard like the UITP commitment and the other commitments which were made in, uh, in, in New York during this, uh, the, uh, the climate summit of the Secretary General. So you could say that the credibility of the transport sector is at stake. We need to ensure that the commitments that we have made in the last two years, that we are actually delivering those. So in that context, we will come up with a report uh, by the middle of the year to take stock of where these commitments are. We will also give the opportunity to people who want to make new commitments so, so that we actually add on to this. But it is clear that if we are not able to give means of implementation, we are not going to achieve it. What is important is where we will be working on this year is building national support. How many people sitting in this room represent a national government? Huh? So we have about five votes huh? who can vote in favor of transport in the sustainable development goal process and in the climate process. So it will be essential to actually leave the room, leave the comfort of our own offices and of our own organizations, and to enter into a dialogue with the countries to make this happen. And then lastly, following up what, 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 what Corgi is saying, is that governments, if they govern properly, do what the people tell them. So it is important that there is also a certain amount of pressure coming from the general public. So while SLOCAT is, up, is not a organization which is about mass mobilization, but we have members who are doing these kinds of things. So we would like to work with them as well. But I would like to come back to the first remark. 2015 is the year that we can unleash our passion for sustainable transport at a scale, at a stage which is unprecedented. Thanks very much. Jorge, please. Uh, actions. Uh, CAF uh, is a bank, and uh, the main activity that we do is to lend money to our country members. So we will continue lending money uh, under our own agenda and, and also under the commitment that we had made and Corny just referred to the commitment that we made together with the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, the uh, European Development Bank, the World Bank, and IDB to put $175 billion in 10 years trying to emphasize sustainable transport. And that doesn't mean that we are going to stop building roads we have to continue building roads because we don't build or we don't fund projects that we want to fund. We fund the projects that are requested by the member countries. And the member countries in many of these regions that we are helping are still needing roads. And not is because the 100% of the population is going to have cars. It's because they need at least one road to get one bus or one truck to take their children to school or to take sick people to hospitals. And without the road, many times it's impossible to do it. If you have to go on a bicycle, you need also a road. So we will continue financing the countries. We will try to put the emphasis in sustainable transport. And what we are doing in CAF, that in 10, 15 years ago, we probably 60% of the portfolio was transport, and 80% of that were roads, rural roads. Now we have changed and switched, and we've been financing a lot of public transport system in the last few years. Together with the World Bank and IDB, we have been recently financing the uh, metro in Panama, uh, metro in Lima, metro in Quito. So there is a number of big projects in Latin America that you haven't seen 
in the previous 20 years that are now are taking place. In addition to the funding, we provide technical assistance. We help the country's members, and I repeat, country members are our owners. They are the partners of these banks. We are not independent bodies that as a myth of many people can come with a hammer and tell countries what they have to do and how they have to do it. The countries are the owners of our banks and we have to have a relationship that makes things happen in the best possible way. Financing the projects they need, but trying to help them to do the projects in the best possible way. In addition to the funding, we are providing a lot of technical assistance, creating knowledge, and to be aligned with what I mentioned in my first intervention, which is the need to provide information, to edu educate the civil society, to make information symmetric for both the government and the citizens, we have continued working with the Observatory of Urban Mobility for Latin America that had been put in place seven years ago. There are now 25 cities of Latin America of which we have all kinds of information that is a public good and as a public good is accessible to everyone. Anyone, journalists, citizens, kids can reach through the web to that information and know everything they want to know about the transport system in their cities. In addition to this observatory, three years ago we have launched the program that is called Cities with a Future. And this is a comprehensive plan to work with the cities, not only sector by sector, but try to help in planning the cities in a much more comprehensive way. And these Cities with Future are mainly thinking in inclusive urban development, uh, transformation of the productive matrix, uh, making sustainable environment and also producing a strong change in their institutional arrangements, which we believe is probably the key for the changes in these cities. Something that uh, Jose Luis was talking about share. Uh, I found a little bit funny that uh, we have talked very little about share prosperity, which is the name of the conference. Uh, and, uh, but what is prosperity? And probably because it's not quite, quite clear what is prosperity is that we haven't talked about prosperity during the most of the conference. Uh, when I was young uh, and I heard the word prosperity, I thought that prosperity was something like, you know, creating wealth, becoming rich, just having money, and with the money you can buy properties, and that is all about prosperity. But now prosperity is, as many other words, becoming something that has to be shared, and I agree with this concept. And going in depth, Prosperity is a much more comprehensive, and if we are talking about smart cities for shared prosperity, we are thinking that prosperity is something different than just making a few people rich. Uh, last year, uh, and again, aligned with this idea that as a public institution, we have to provide information to educate those who want to learn more and in addition to the information of the urban, mo urban mobility of the, <coughs> of the observatory, we have made an uh, agreement with UN Habitat and we are now creating the City Prosperity Index. So we are now going to measure prosperity to just step out of leaving this as a conceptual word which can become meaningless if you don't understand what it means. So we are working now in trying to determine the index for five Latin American cities, for those who are interested in knowing which they are, is Panama, Quito, Guayaquil, uh, both last two in Ecuador, Fortaleza in Brazil, and uh, Lima, Peru. This prosperity index has a number of many indicators, but are indicators rel related to productivity, quality of life, infrastructure in where transportation is a key element, equity and social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and the last but not least, uh, legislation and governance. And this is a key factor. By when we probably, at the end of this year, have the city prosperity index of these five cities, we will be able to start measuring the prosperity and governments, local governments that will want to work in the share of prosperity among their citizens will be through these indicators 
able to understand what things has to be changed and how they compare to other cities in order to make this concept of prosperity something that is more easy to understand. So, so far, these are the actions, and uh, we think that uh, we, in our actions, are aligning the words that we are saying in public as I uh, started my presentation in my first intervention. Thank you very much. Anida Skupta. Thanks. I just, I just want, I mean, all our panelists talked about how important this year is, and we fully and totally believe that. I want to extend not only the, um, the Paris meeting, the SDG meetings, but also uh, next spring is the Habitat 3 meeting. These are all connected events, and I actually do believe that um, this is a uh, opportunity for us uh, to, uh, to bring together all the things that we agree on. And as, as Jose Luis says, together. So the more single voice we are, better it will be. Uh, I do think we are in a good position. I mean, when uh, uh, the meeting in New York uh, in preparation to the Lima meeting took place that the Secretary General organized, cities was a, a very important part of the conversation. The cities actually matter a big way to the climate change discussion. I think that's, that is getting to be common wisdom and transportation and mobility matters a lot to how cities function. So it's, it's a good discussion, the good direction that's going on, and I hope we achieve um, very with, with our support and everyone's support, achieve um, substantial outcomes there, and this is a great opportunity uh, this year. So I don't want to repeat what I said. We believe that our work to bring to our organization, obviously, both sides to support these global processes. And one of the specific things uh, we would do uh, in New York when people met, they, uh, 60 mayors signed on the uh, mayor's protocol to make specific um, uh, reduction goals. We want to support that process to see how, what does it mean, what are the core benefits of it, so that it actually matters when they meet in Paris and later. So that's one specific thing we'll work with our C40 colleagues. We also want very strongly believe that measurement of any of these progress are important, and we come together in making sure that we are developing common measurement protocols to make impact as we go forward. This is not only, not only useful in a nerdy way that measurement is good, it's very important politically to show that progress is made by, to get local communities change behavior to, to people to allocate funds towards it. So something we have worked with World Bank um, and ICLE on developing the GHG Global Greenhouse Protocol for Cities. That's one of the widely used things. We are actually working with our partners across to help implement. I hope more of this happens, but this is a start. We need to build on that to have much more politically acceptable uh, indicators that's available to everyone. So at the global level, like we want to support the process going forward, we want much more common practice of measurements across. But we, like I think a lot of you here, uh, believe though the agreements are global, um, pretty much all action is local. Uh, so we, our team very much is focused on working at city and national level to find actual solutions so these commitments can be transferred, translated to real, real changes for people on the ground. So we will continue to do so. We will focus on developing, bringing smart mobility in national policies or local policies like you heard from Mayor Mancera in Mexico. Uh, we are working in India, supporting the government to bring similar ideas in the national policies. But also we work very locally in specific project to bring these ideas we're talking about to reality where people are involved in mobility, where space is created, safe, uh, cities are more safer because uh, uh, transportation is more safer uh, and la land uh, planning, land planning is connected with transportation. These are the things we'll continue to do so and we, are, we work in five countries or 57 cities, but we think having, creating real local solutions with our partners is very key to not only local progress, but also the global progress we are talking about. So, but everything we do, we do with partnership. Partnership is part and parcel of our business model. Thank you very much. Jose Luis. So on our commitments, and uh, here I'd like to mention under the leadership of Pierre and the whole management team and the 300 people that work in the transport and ICT practice, Obviously, we are going to continue with our lending, stepping up our lending. Uh, if you talk about urban transport, our portfolio today is 7.7 .7 billion. Uh, it's increasing every year, uh, the proportion of that goes to urban transport, sustainable urban transport, 24%, 25% this year, added uh, part of our annual commitments. On road safety, we are, ensuring that all our road projects are 
addressing road safety with at least an indicator that allows us to work on that agenda or a component. And we are committing to bring closer also solutions with uh, our health colleagues. An example is, for example, in, is in, in India, where uh, we have a road safety corridor and with our health colleagues that have a health project in the same state, they are doing uh, the, the health part of that corridor, the response to emergencies, etc. We are committed also to, in, in this context, to ensure that we help uh, national governments work with uh, emerging cities and in many cases with the mega cities that even require some support and putting in place the institutional setup that will be needed. We know this is complex. We have a, a publication that's called the Institutional Labyrinth, but we will continue in spite of the difficulties. A second area in which we would like to make a strong commitment is in terms of knowledge and tools that we use, we want to develop for the benefit of our clients. We'll point here first ongoing efforts to roll out uh, the green gas, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions analysis for our transport projects. Calendar year, this calendar year, every, every new appraisal will, will introduce this tool to measure, to, to trace what is the impact in terms of emissions. And we are doing this uh, in the, the methodology and working together with our climate change uh, VP who has developed a group with all the multilaterals and all the uh, EFIs to come with a harmonized tool because it will be a little bit embarrassing if different tools give you completely different estimates and sometimes working on, this, on similar projects. And in this context also, we are working to expand our transport appraisal methodologies to include the other externalities as was mentioned during the conference. So not only uh, the, the, the economic aspects, but also the local air measuring and, and evaluating the impact of uh, local air pollution, congestion, transport safety risks, in addition to uh, greenhouse em emissions. All of this come together in a methodology that will give a better sense of uh, how sustainable are our projects. Also under the knowledge initiatives, we like to ensure that everyone has, every client has access to good data and the knowledge, planning tools to make informed decisions. You have heard probably the leaders in urban transport program that we are implement, have been implemented with many of, uh, of our partners, our strategic partners, including Embark, for example, in Mexico, Coti in, in Korea, in Singapore, the Land Academy in Singapore, the Agence Francaise, UITP. So we will continue that effort and we are committed to including in that training a module on emerging cities. We are working uh, on another initiative that is to create a robust database. In, in, and here maybe Alain, you would like to announce that, so we are going to work together in which UITP will help in standardizing the kind of information. We would like to create a platform so cities and operators can bring their data and as a, as a benefit for their contribution, they will have access to information from other cities and other operators to benchmark. Finally, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that see, when we were created as a global practice, this is transport and ICT. So we are committing to a vision of smarter cities, for example, and of using the, making, bringing the best use of technology to the transport sector. It may look like uh, something that is far, it's a reality already happening in many of our projects. The use of technology, for example, to allow seamless integration between modes now is possible thanks to the smart card. And we are using this in several projects. But we are seeing also that smart solutions are getting smarter. We heard uh, in Brazil last year the, the experience of uh, bringing, connecting with the subsidies of Bolsa Familia, for example, through the smart card. And, uh, it's also happening, the use of technology to improve the planning and to improve the performance of uh, operators, but also the experience of travelers. 
we are working in Brazil, for example, in Sao Paulo, and in various places this is happening. So we are making a strong commitment of everyone, every city that wants to work with us on, on expanding the use of technology will be there. And the idea again is to, de to develop these tools that are centered in supporting the business and in particular citizens. The, the tension that sometimes exists when, when you think about techie solutions is that you believe that it's only for an elite. It's the opposite. We want to, and, and this is one of the tools that have been developed, an accessibility uh, tool that will look at access from the, the poor people access to different different facilities, uh, be able to measure this using technology. You know? So on the contrary, these are designed to ensure that so we can set the solutions that will benefit the poor. I think it's enough of commitments. <laughs> I was about to yes. say. <laughs> Any more and you're going to make some people in this room nervous. Um, <laughs> I think really I've heard some very impressive commitments here. I've heard commitments that relate to generating standards for measurement of achievements, and I've also heard commitments relating to multiplying and mobilizing, basically to generating outreach that perhaps goes back to Jorge Kogan's point, how do we get bottom-up, people-powered um, change going, and I think a lot of you have expressed commitments that do head in that direction. And I wish all of you the very best of luck in achieving the commitments that you have made here. And I think one of our goals for 2016, besides serving free lunch, possibly, um, <laughs> would be, would be to, uh, to measure up on uh, how those commitments how those commitments look a year later. Um, you know, be happy that it's limited at lunch, the suggestion. If Belgium were advising you, they would surely tell you that there is no event in Belgium that ever takes place without champagne. <laughs> Pierre being Belgian, maybe we have a chance. <laughs> May I, before we end this session and uh, move on to the closing words, may I briefly say thank you not only to all of our panelists up here on the stage right now, but also to all of you who have participated in the discussions uh, throughout these two days. We are not going to take audience questions. I'm very sorry, but we're very close to uh, the end of our time. And in fact, we have to leave this room in 10 minutes. So um, I would like to say thank you to all of you in the audience for your participation, your attention during very intensive sessions, uh, your contributions and questions, all very, very helpful in the discussions. So many thanks to you. And one last thanks to all the partners and sponsors who have made Transforming Transportation 2015 such a very great success. I'll read their names off and then you can applaud for all of them as well. The Inter-American Development Bank, CAF Development Bank of Latin America, the Asian Development Bank, I'm not reminding you who these organizations are, I think you know by now, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy and the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, all of the very, very, very valuable partners in this effort. And of course, the two sponsors without whom uh, it would not have been possible, um, the, tw the uh, Transit Center, the New York City-based foundation, and the PTV Group, which provides logistics and transport support. All of them have been a very big part of making this event such a success. So many thanks to all of them, to all of you on the stage, and all of you out there. <laughs>